Thanks, Rolf. Evening, ladies and gents. Uh, so, time, you know, calendars are like complicated things sometimes. Um, when I put this presentation together or proposed it to, to Paul, who, who, who's my JC contact, and he loved the idea. This was back in September, and, you know, where was the bear market? Oh, it was years away. And, well, actually, you know, welcome to the bear market. It happened last Wednesday. Uh, we officially hit bear market. Uh, if you joined the market in the last 10 years, welcome to your first bear market, because we haven't had one in the last decade. Um, so, you know, hey, this is fun and games. Of course, the good news is the bear market's over already. It started on Wednesday. It finished on Wednesday, but we'll come into that in a moment. So, so whilst this was supposed to be about prophesizing, and I love prophesizing, notwithstanding that perhaps you know, easier to do than perhaps to get right. Um, when I'm talking bear, it's local, but we'll delve into, into the rest of it. I want to touch on where the different markets are, how we respond, what's happening locally, and where I think we, this will eventually play out and how it will eventually end and, and how we should, as different types of investors and traders, respond to, 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 to bear markets. Um, the, 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 the bulls and the bears, they come, they go, they're supposed to be cyclical. We have had a weird decade since the credit crisis of 08, 09. And the reason we've had a weird decade is twofold. One is incredibly low interest rates. In cases, we've had negative interest rates in some economies. Um, and we've had, even in South Africa, we had interest rates at, at 50-year lows. In the US, they had interest rates at historical lows for protracted periods of time, which made for a a different type of market. Um, hence, we've had uh, anomalies, and, and, and what we've seen in the last decade has been, has been what we don't typically see, and that we should see a lot more activity, a lot more cyclicality to the market itself. Quick point on why we call them bulls and bears, because the bull fights by dropping on its on a, and raising itself up and, and bucking you up, so bulls are rising. Bears fight by going up and then coming down on you and knocking you down, hence the bull and the bear market. So if you, I mean, random factoid, but hey, if ever you're in a pub at late at night, you can impress probably nobody, but hey. <laughs> um, so what is a bear market? So let's start at the top. 5% drawdowns. These happen all the time. You know, so stock, stock equity index, whatever, goes up, comes back 5%. We should truthfully have at least one or two per year. And we've been seeing these. These have been coming along with the regularity that they normally do. The S&P last year not, but the S&P last year was something that we've never seen in the history of it. 10% drawdowns we call correction. We should get one of those every year or two. Um, so we should be getting, a, they're fairly frequent. 20% um, drawdown, which is a, a, a bear market, we should be having one every three to five years. So the credit crisis 10 years ago, we should have had two or three of these things already, and we haven't. I mean, we have, we, South Africa's had one now. Last Wednesday, we hit into it literally for about an hour or two. I mean, enough time for me to tweet it out. Um, and, and that was about it. Um, and then those big ones, those 40 or 50% drawdowns, those really, really nasty beasts, we've had two in 100 years. The credit crisis of 08, 09, and 1929. And looking around, I don't think any of us were trading in 1929. Um, so we should have, and, and I'm going to park that one there for now. These are, should be fairly regular events. Markets are cyclical. They go up, they go down. Big picture, long term, they go up, uh, but not in the straight line. They should never go up in straight lines. What we've seen, as I said, in that last decade is straight lines. Let's quickly touch on why. So. Very, very cheap money, free money in essence. You could borrow money in the U.S. at a quarter of a percent, and you stick it in the stock market, which has a dividend yield of 2%, and you're making money. No rocket science required. It was just that simple. And, and the reason why the Fed and other economies, um, uh, Super Mario in, in, in Europe and, and, and uh, uh, Japan and everywhere else, uh, Switzerland and Sweden went to negative rates, is they were wanting to flood the economy with money so that people would go and spend things, so that that would do two things. It would underpin the economy and create uh, profits for companies and therefore create employment and bonuses that would create spending, that would create profit for companies, and so that whole cycle goes. And broadly, it's worked. It's worked very well in America. Uh, the problem is Europe being Europe, we were about three to four years late to the party. Um, America went to 
practically no interest rates very, very quickly. Quantitative easing, throwing money at the problem very, very quickly. Europe is longer, and the reason why it takes Europe longer, because although Mario Draghi is, is the boss of the, of, of the central bank there, they've got 21 economies, and it's complicated. And there was Greece, and there were the pigs. Remember the pigs? Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece, and Spain. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's fine, you know, when it's, when it's just Bernanke or whatever, you know, and his couple of committee members, boom, boom, they do it. You get 21 countries to try and agree on, on, on any sort of process, it's not going to happen. I mean, we know what committees do, right? I mean, so that then put the money into the system. The trick is Europe is behind the curve. Europe is still doing quantitative easing. Europe still has low interest rates. America's storming ahead, and the rest of the world is left sort of, you know, staring in wonderment at it. Um, Europe is modeling along and doing okay. The European banks are in a bad state, but that, that's a different story entirely. Quickly touch on why are European banks in a bad state? Because they keep on lending to countries like Greece and Turkey and Italy, and and really you shouldn't. Um, you know, like that family member who hits you up for 20 bucks, and you're like, nope. Like, not going to happen, not going to lend you even 10 bucks. That's like lending to, to those economies. The problem, particularly like when you lend to Turkey, you're lending in euros, but they're not, they've got lira, Turkish lira, and when the currency goes, the debt goes, and it all gets very, very ugly. Um, countries like Greece, like Italy, like Spain, like Portugal, like Ireland, their debt to GDP is north of 100. We're stressing because we get into 54% debt to GDP and like this is the end of the world and the IMF is going to have to bail us out. Man, Western Europe would, would, like, would, would give you Greece if they could have 54% debt to GDP. And truthfully, we'll take Greece. Greece is quite lacquer. Some islands, some uzo, some olives, nothing wrong with Greece. Um, so, so we've had a weird... 10 years, and that's not to be unexpected. If we go back to 1929 and that crisis, I mean, that ended up in the Depression. That was a total disaster. They had to build the Hoover Dam and other such things to try and get out of it. Teddy Roosevelt got three and a half terms in office, and that sort of, you know, th there was a proper, proper crisis. There were, there were points in 2008, 2009. I joined Standard Bank uh, Online Share Trading in February 07. I was on the trading for 400 traders. Um, and then some offices in London and, and the like. But there were points there when, when we didn't actually know that this would end well. And there, there were like I would go home and check my pumpkin seeds just to be sure. Um, it did end well, but it was really, really scary, as I'm sure it was if you read uh, literature around 1929. Um, hence the response from the Reserve Banks. Unfortunately, Bernanke's PhD was on 1929. We just had the right man at the right time. And his answer was money. Just throw money at the problem. You know what? We own the printing presses. I remember him saying once upon a time, the big risk is inflation. And now literally 10 years later, we're starting to see it. And that's part of that money into the system. You plug money into the system, this should start to create inflation. And, well, it is now, but literally it's taken 11 years to get to that point. Um, the U.S. is currently in the longest bull market ever. Not in percentages, but in duration. The bottom of the bull market was March uh, 2009. Ben Bernanke woke up one morning and said he is seeing green shoots. And that was it. That it never looked back. Um, they have basically had no 20% pullback in that entire period. They've had some corrections, 10% corrections, another one there, another one there, but no bear market in a 10-year period. We have never seen that in the history of the S&P. That is the longest. The previous longest was the 80s. Before that was the 90s. Um, that is the longest bull market in the history of, of, of the U.S. And that's what free money does. Free money just makes for crazy things. Um, so the U.S. has done incredibly well, spectacular. Last year, 26% uh, in the U.S. last year was a was a was a absolute like thumper number for for a low inflation. Understand, stock market returns should be broadly linked to inflation. So you know, our inflation in South Africa, let's call it five percent, which means markets should be averaging 12%. U.S. inflation, let's call it two percent. Their market should be averaging about eight percent a year. Um, but what it also means is, and let's take the U.S., if you've just had that type of a market, it means your next 10 years going forward are going to be less impressive. Because what you've got here is a market that is well ahead of the long-term average. If your long-term average is 10% and you do 20% a year for a decade to get back to the average, well, now you've got to do 5% a year for a decade. The flip is in South Africa, where our return of the last five years has been exactly zero. Uh, we blame Christia for Hayden for that. Um, at some, when, when that finishes happening, 
we've actually now got a period of outperformance to take us back to the average. Now, anyone who knows anything about stats, and even if you know nothing about stats, appreciates that what I'm saying there is all statistically true, but might not happen in reality, because stats and reality are not even cousins. So where are the bears? Well, there are bears everywhere. So top 40, uh, these charts on Tuesday are Monday close, except some of them are, are, are not, but most of them are from the close on Monday. From the high of November last year, which was just ahead of NASRAC. Remember, the world was going to be wonderful and everything was going to be great. From that high, which is where you measure, uh, from the high during the course of 15 of November, on Wednesday of last week, we were officially 20% down, top to bottom. We officially were in bear market territory. It literally lasted an hour or so. It bounced, uh, and let's put some perspective into it. So that is Monday's close at 45,100. That is this afternoon. We're already 1,600 points up off that Monday. And today's Thursday. Yes, today's definitely Thursday. So let's put that in some perspective. There's where we are now. Well, basically, that's where we've been literally since the middle of 2014. Our market's done nothing. What we had was this range here, going nowhere, nowhere, nowhere. Then we had NASRIC, and we basically moved our range higher and now we've basically come back down. So although it feels like the world is ending, uh, like we actually just haven't really gone anywhere at all, which is you know, a terrible thing. Let's point out, there are two ways that markets correct, crash, call it what you will. A crash is just terminology when these things happen quickly rather than slowly. So if we go back to October 1987, uh, our market lost 22% in one day. 22% in a day. Went from bull to bear, from like breakfast to lunch. In fact, from breakfast to morning tea, we were down 22% in one single day. So we call that a crash because of the speed of it happening. But there are two ways that markets correct. One is in price. In other words, the crash of 1987, the crash of 1969, the crash of 1998, the, the dot-com bust of 2001, and of course, the credit crisis of 08 09. And that happens with great speed, and, and, and scariness, et cetera. And what happens is that the companies are still the same, but the prices come down, so the valuations go up. Because markets become expensive. You know, companies earning X and they're growing their profit at 10% a year, but the share price is growing at 20% a year, makes it expensive. You've got to bring it back to normality. And you bring it back to normality with prices diving off a cliff, or you bring it back to normality where prices go sideways for a protracted period of time whilst the earnings profits are increasing. And what that means is that you're buying the, same, you're buying the business for the same price, but you're getting more bang for your buck. So markets correct in price, and that's when it goes down, or they correct in time, which is when they do that. Me, I prefer the price. Give me a crash. Boom, boom, headlines, get in the front page of the newspaper, have some fun, and then we can go off on our jolly way again. That, to me, is just, like, painful. I mean, if you've been in this market the last one, two, three, four, five years, you know how much fun it is to look and realize Granny Matilda, with her money under the blanket, is making more money than you. Like, really? Like, that's not how it's meant to be. Truthfully, four and a half years, short term. Anything less than five years is short term. I know it's easy to say, and particularly if you only just started, there's no fun to it. Markets do this sometimes. The bad news is, is that we are on the longest sideways move in our market in the history of the JSC. So when I did a presentation in December at JSC last year, and I said, well, the good news is, is we've never had a four-year sideways market, so we're going to break up. Well, the bad news is we now have a five-year sideways market. <laughs> As I said, stats and truth are not even cousins. But the perspective is, at that point, we really thought things were looking better, and, well, we're just back where we have been for a very, very long time. Uh, but there's some perspective on the top 40. There's the bottom in March 2009. There's his return. That bottom was 16,000 points. We're at 46,000 points. 40. Can I round that up to 48? I know you can't, but let's pretend I can. That's 300% excluding dividends. And that's, yeah, we're worrying about that, but we're forgetting about that part there. So that's the six years, and then that's the four years. It's when we got into the market. So if you got in there, everything's lacquer, but if you got in there, Nothing's like it. The point is, that'll happen again. It'll happen again. And some real perspective, there is the crisis of 2008 to 2009. Our market was uh, 31,000, went down to under 16. We lost 50%, 50%. 
percent. Um, and it happened in about a 13 months, 14 months. Um, it, was, it was scary. It was, I mean, I'd, actually, I was too probably too naive to truly true. I remember one day uh, ETV, not ENCA, ETV come onto the trading floor and want to talk to someone about the market crashing. And it's about that point there. And like 399 traders say, no, no, not me. And I'm so ignorant. I'm like, hey, I'll talk to TV. Like, hey, face on TV, you bet ya. Um, so here's a top tip. When you see me on ETV, not ENCA, when you see me on ETV, probably we're at the bottom. Because with respect to the media, they're usually a little late to the party. Um, I mean, they'd missed all of that. They arrive here. I and mean, it's like, guys, oh, like, and you know what my response is always the same? Don't panic. Don't panic. It's too late. You want to panic, you panic there. So just some perspective. And then we're off to the races. And from 16,000, we're now at 48, which puts us somewhere up on the floor above us. Uh, Indy 25, uh, this is, Indy 25 is in bear market. That was where the bear market started, uh, 68,000. We're now down at 61. Now, this is Monday's chart. Uh, since then, NASPAS has been on an absolute stonker of a run. But the Indy 25 is in bear market. The point is, the Indy 25 has been the best performing up to that point, the best performing index in our market by 100 miles. Um, if, that, if that chart looks impressive, 300%, the ND did 750, more than double. Mostly driven by NASPASS, that beast there. Uh, NASPASS has subsequently recovered uh, and is trading at about there, 2750, around about there. Quickly touch on NASPASS. It's a giant outsize in our, in our index, around 20%. That is not an anomaly. We've had it in South Africa 15 years ago. It was Anglo-American and Billiton. Uh, and if you look at markets around the world, every single market in the world, except the S&P 500, if you take the top 10% of the stocks in the index, they are usually between 60 and 80% of the index. Some outlier exceptions is India, where the top two companies are 60%. Uh, Italy, where the top three companies are 60%. But even the UK, so you, FTSE 100 is 100 stocks. You take the top 10 stocks, they are 54%. In South Africa, that concentration, in the U.S., it's broadly the same. In the U.S., Apple is 6%, which is like, I appreciate it's not 20, but you've got 500 shares and one of them is 6%. You always get that concentration. And then at some point, the concentration turns poor, as is happening with NASPASS, but it happened with Anglo and Billiton, and we survived it. We do survive it. NASPASS has some challenges. So the big story with NASPASS, quickly, let's go down there. <clears throat> There's two stories happening. One is obviously Tencent. Uh, and the story of Tencent is their ability to issue new games into China. China is very concerned about how much time the youth are spending on the games. They're concerned about their eyesight and all of that sort of thing. So they started clamping down on the ability to issue new games in China. And then last week, they just stopped and they said, we're not clamping down. We just, there will be no new games issued in China until we sort it out. The problem was there were three or four different departments issuing the licenses and China says, no, no, we want one. The truth is, I mean, games in China is big for Tencent, but they've also got QQ. They've also got WeChat. They've also, and understand WeChat in China is how you live. Um, I've got a friend who goes to China occasionally and she comments, that your, your beggars on the side of the street, when they ask you for money and you haven't got any, they say, well, QQ, you, know, you can pay me with, 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 with like virtual money. Um, gaming is important. It will come back. Uh, there was a second issue for NASPASS, and that is the shares that we buy. NASPASS N shares have low voting rights. There are other shares out there held by grannies in the Karoo and the like, that have a thousand times more voting rights than NASPASS N shares. The MSCI were, have a global index, and they were going to downweight shares that didn't have full voting rights, i.e. NASPASS would have been downweighted. They decided not to. Hence, NASPASS then started booming to the clouds again. That will come back. Don't get me wrong. The MSCI hasn't decided that they will never. The MSCI has decided that they won't right now which means at some point they will come and revisit this. This is not something that NASPASS can solve because 
comp it's a, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but this is not something that's going to be solved in a hurry. Um, and NASPAS's desire to unlock value is going to have to come from somewhere else, multi-choice, New York listings, and all of those bits and pieces. But that's what's been very nasty. And our indie, the NASPAS, is about 35%. In the top 40, it's about 20%. And that has been the single biggest drag on our market. Uh, and NASPAS is in full bear market from 4,000 and change to today, 27. Even at that point, it's more than 20% off those highs. The mid cap is not yet in bear market. The bear market will hit at 66,000, so it's relatively close. The S&P is in correction mode, but bear market is 2,300, still some way away. So we've seen lots of markets in correction, but not lots of markets that are in bear market, except for those with NASPAS in it. Um, NASDAQ in correction mode, but again, still some way bear mode will be 61 and some change from there. This obviously the tech heavy and has rebounded quite nicely uh, Wednesday uh, and was trading up when I checked an hour or so again now as well. But they all are in correction mode. They're all 10% down. Uh, Russell 2000, which is the mid and small cap index in the US, literally has 2000 shares in it. Again, correction mode, not bear market yet. Um, DAX, which is Germany, is close to bear market uh, and has rallied a bit off there, but again, correction rather than bear. FTSE, ironically, sort of doing okay, notwithstanding Brexit or not, or I don't know. They don't know either, truthfully. Theresa, no one has a clue there. Fortunately, they're in Ireland, so we can just ignore them. Uh, correction mode, but not yet in bear market. So what are we seeing? We're seeing a lot of corrections, we're not seeing many bear markets. Uh, in the developed market, we're seeing no bear markets at all, but we're seeing corrections. In emerging markets, big bag. Brazil's at almost all-time highs. Uh, Russia is in solid correction. Turkey is in bear market deluxe, uh, and we are kind of flirting with it. So what the trend is, and it certainly has been over the last five or six weeks of the sell-off, that we have simply had a global correction. Markets across the world are sold off somewhere between 10 and 15 percent. In some cases, such as Turkey and ourselves, that took us into bear space. For the rest, they're just into correction space. It, 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 you know, we'll come to individual stocks in a moment, but that is not an unnormal occurrence. And even when we say that the S&P has not been in, in bear for the last decade, it has had corrections, just not with the level of regularity that we would normally have expected Again, because of that very free, very cheap money. Uh, lots of stocks are in bear mode. So uh, Facebook is 20% in, 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 is down. Amazon, Tesla was, but is out. Apple is 12% uh, down, although results out today, tonight, after market. We'll either correct that one way or another. Locally, in our equity market, man, oh, man, we have stocks in like bear market and worse. I mean, you know what? I stopped typing only because I ran out of space. <laughs> MTN, Aspen, Mediclinic, Steinhoff, Famous Brands, Woolies, Choppies, Avenge, Signia, Tongart, and so the list goes on. There are a few stocks that are at or around all-time highs. Exara, I know, who would have thought, eh? Cool. Uh, Capitech, uh, back above 1000 bucks today. Uh, so it's down year-to-date 9%, but, but there's, we've seen a lot of individual stocks and a lot of those a lot of these companies with some exceptions i mean choppies i put there just because i was right and i love saying i told you so um avenge ditto um but a lot of these were the high flyers too close to the sun too beautiful too can't do anything wrong and then did something wrong in the case of uh, uh famous brands and woolies big offshore deals so here's a top tip when a company does a big offshore deal, get out, sell it. If you want to be ballsy, go short. No, trust me, I own those two. Name me, let's put it the other way, let's be more generous. Tell me some of companies in South Africa that have done offshore deals, big ones, that worked. I was going to say Woolies, but I see that now. Nope. Australian. Woolies is down 50% from the highs. I mean, there must be some, mm. right? And I keep... Mm. Naspas. No, good point, Naspas. Some of the property guys. Do some that did offshore deals or went offshore many years ago, like Bulletin. Mm-hmm. Yes. Consistent so so consistent. there are some that have, have offshored themselves, such as Bulletin. So there's one, really. So Naspas, yes, some of the property guys. 
SAB. SAB. And of course, here's the deep irony, right? I owned SAB. They went offshore. What did I do? I sold them. In 1990 something at 85 Rand, because I didn't trust these guys to know what to do offshore. Discovery lost a billion offshore. Uh, Woolies, uh, sorry, well, Woolies lost money in, in Nigeria when they went and did a winter range. Have you noticed? Nigeria, equator, no winter, guys. Uh, Pick and Pay lost a billion with Franklin's in Australia. Telcom lost a billion with uh, Multilinks in Nigeria. Uh, I mean, it's easier to name the successes. Sorry? Yeah, Invicta, South Korea, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, and the reason's really quite simple, right? Because you're a big fish in a small pond and you think to yourself, hmm, I can be a big fish in a big pond. No, you can't, man. There's sharks in that pond. You know your market. You have spent a career, an entire business, knowing your market. And then you're just like, oh, I'll hop over here. What's an Aussie? How hard can that be? It's a different market. So start small. Do it gently, which is exactly what SAB did. They didn't go and buy Miller. They went and bought snow beer in China. No one had heard of it. They slowly did it, and, and they are the exception. Slow and steady. We're seeing it with Imperial. Uh, they went and bought a little car thing in, 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 in the UK, and, and it's, you know, it's small, and they will grow it over time. Don't go and buy something twice the size of you and, no, man, leave it alone. Um, and then some of these, of course, are, well, MTN, uh, well, you know, I mean, Aspen. <sighs> Aspen is X growth, right? Aspen is now a mature stock with defensive brands, and that should be trading on a PE of about 10 or 12. What's it currently trading on? About 10 or 12. 440 Rand for Aspen was mad. 160, probably a fair price. Um, Mediclinic, ugh, I just don't like drug dealers. Uh, Steinhoff, like crooks, just crooks. Yeah. In, in years to come, I'll say you're a Steinhoff. What I mean is you're a Skellum. Um, and so they go on. I mean, there's lots of individual stocks. And if you've got a portfolio of individual stocks, your, your mileage may vary. Um, I, I'm, you know, my portfolio this year is not looking too bad, in part because the Woolies and Famous Brands were last year's collapse, not this year's collapse. And I've got some stocks in there. Discovery's doing okay. It's down a bit, but not too much. My, my uh, Capitex are, are uh, down a little bit for the year. So your mileage will vary. The lesson is, and I'm going off track from bears, but it's a critically important lesson. The lesson is that there are two things that matter when we buy a company, and there's only one that we control. The two things are by quality. By quality. And that's why Choppies is there, because Choppies was never quality. If you own 50 retail outlets, you've got no, 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 no capacity, you've got no distribution center. And understand that Mr. Choppies went to ShopRite and said, please buy me. And ShopRite's like, nah. <coughs> well, if ShopRite don't want you, I don't want you either. Understand that businesses will rather, I mean, famous brands have put their gourmet indigestion into the UK version of Business Rescue. Trust me, they did that because they couldn't sell it. They try to sell it. Everyone's like, mm -hmm, I don't want your indigestion. So it's like, okay, Business Rescue. Um, and, and a lot of, first point of call is buy the quality. In a raging bull market, man, buy whatever moves. But we haven't been in a raging bull market since 2006. We went up 42% in one year. In a normal market, in a market like we're seeing now, quality matters. Best way to define quality is cash flow, dividends, and those sort of things. And, and we can get more complicated. The second critical point is understand there is only one thing that we control in the stock market. We as individuals. And that is the price you pay. Nothing else do you control. The profitability of the company, the dividend, the price you sell at, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, are beyond our control. The price we pay is at our control. And the control we have is I will pay the price or I won't pay the price. We need to exercise that I won't pay the price. And I know when NASPASS is rushing to 4,400 and when Aspen is rushing to 440 and when MTN is rushing to 285, there is a deep sense of FOMO. Man, I wish I was on that bus. You know what? You missed the bus. Find another bus or wait for that one to come back around. But overpaying, you know, at, at 440, Aspen was on a 40 PE, 40 PE, which means in simple metrics, Aspen needed to grow at 40% a year to justify that. 
And yet they were buying businesses that were growing at 10 or 11% a year. They were buying, you know, X growth businesses at 10 or 11% growth, in some cases 4 or 5% growth. How do you sustain 40 PE when you're buying businesses growing at 5 or 10? And I know, like, you turn on the TV and that shares up again and you don't own it. That's fine. Just turn the TV off. <laughs> Unless I'm on your TV. <laughs> But it comes back to exercising that, that final control we have. And I know, and I mean, and I've done it and I've been there and, and I, I was buying the heckness out of ShopRite at 240 and now it's 170 and I'm looking like, I mean, Woolies, I've got so many Woolies shares, I'm going to get a board seat. And I stopped buying Woolies at 62.50 and it went to 48 and change. I mean, it's not a perfect science, but we need some sort of metric to say, I don't like that price. And if you want more, you can. there's stuff in just one lap where you can mail me uh, on how I do the methodology in terms of pricing for my death draft part portfolio, which is my very long-term portfolio. Quick disclaimer of the shares on here, our own famous brands and woolies. So what feeds the bears? Truthfully, cycles. Markets go up, markets go down. Uh, valuations. In this case, valuations get stretched because of free money, because of very, very cheap money. Um, and therefore, you know, you go and buy, as I said, a share with a 2% dividend yield and you're paying 1% to borrow the money. Well, you're making money. You're, you're in the process. Uh, fear and greed. That, you know, what drives Aspen to 440? Greed. What, you know, what drives Aspen to 140? Fear. Uh, it, it, it's fear and greed. Um, you know, people scared of missing out on the way up, and then people terrified of holding all the way down and, and the fear part. And, 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 and of course, it's what drives markets. Um, but again, companies like Aspen, they have a, I mean, they make profit. Their profit might be less than it has been, and their growth might be slowing. But let's not cut ourselves, you know, it's a profitable business. Um, and I don't like drugs, uh, medical companies, drug companies, and all regulatory issues, we can park that. Financial crises drive them. Uh, we've had surprisingly few financial crises, obviously 08, uh, 1998, which was the, the Asian Tigers collapsing in a heap. Uh, 87 was not a financial crisis, 69 wasn't. There was the oil crisis of the 70s. But we've had surprisingly few proper, full-blown, global financial crises in our market. The biggie is the U.S. tenure. And I'm going to come back to that, so we'll park that there for now. Ah, no, there it is right there. The U.S. 10-year is essentially the bond rate uh, for uh, the, the U.S. borrows for money for 10 years. Um, as you can see, it got really, really low at one point, and it is starting to grow again. My view is quite simple. When that U.S. hits 3.5%, we are very close, if not at the top of, our, of the U.S. market. And when it hits 4.5%, we will be in full mode bear. Why? Well, firstly, what are we seeing? Why is that rate rising? It's rising because interest rates are going up. Why are interest rates going up? Well, partly because the Fed says the crisis is over, but also because we're starting to see some inflation come into the system. And how do you fight inflation? Well, you push interest rates higher to try and fight inflation. Um, why is it then bad for stock markets? Well, it's bad for stock markets because so companies in and of themselves actually quite like inflation. Because, you know, if inflation's at 10%, they can slip an 11% increase, you won't notice, and they can make an extra 1%, i.e. margins. What we're seeing is the inverse right now. So ShopRite update on Monday, which was dressed up all pretty, but was a horror show. Um, they've got 11,607 items that are cheaper today than they were a year ago. The problem is that ShopRite's costs are increasing. Staff, salaries, electricity, rentals, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, petrol, those have all gone up, but their income hasn't because of that low inflation. So if ShopRite was rocking food inflation of 10%, they would be, you know, absolutely loving it. So companies like inflation, but uh, 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 governors, MPCs, general reserve banks, etc., they don't like inflation. Well, they want to try and manage it. So interest rates start to creep up with inflation. As investors, we say to ourselves, well, hang on a minute. I can put money into the S&P and earn 2% dividend yield and take risk on A, the dividend, and B, the S&P, because it might fall. Or I could buy a 10-year treasury and get 3.1% guaranteed, no questions asked for the next 10 years. 
Oh, that starts to get attractive. Now, for some of us, it's not. For some of us, we want the risk of equity market. We don't want to be in safe assets like bonds. But there are a lot of people who are, people who need the income, pension funds, municipalities, except for those who think that VBS is a party. Um, so there's, a, there's a, suddenly a lot of money that might have been in the stock market with interest rates at 0 0.25 there's a lot of folks who are like, well, we've, we've got to be in the equity market because we need some growth. Now suddenly you can, you, you can take, and your risk is the U.S. government. And don't underestimate, they own the printing press, right? So your risk is like, do they run out of trees? And as that rises, you see more flow money in. So what kills bull markets is either a crisis, but more frequently what kills bull markets is rising interest rates. The world over, rising interest rates kills bull markets and turns them into bear markets. Doesn't turn them into a crisis, doesn't turn them into a crash, but turns them into a bear market. So for my view, what I'm watching for, you know, when does the bear arrive, I'm watching the US 10-year. Just a quick bit of perspective, back to 1953. Um, I mean, that rate has been, I mean, we must not forget that in the 1980s, America was a basket case financially. Um, the Fed rate was 50, was was 17%. Uh, Inflation was 12. Um, it was an absolute bar, bar, bar basket race. Uh, it was a poor flocker. Flocker came in. Um, he was put in, in charge of the Federal Reserve by Reagan, and he kind of fixed it up. And what we've essentially had is a 30-plus year move down. Those levels there were abnormal. We need to get to a normalized level, which is probably somewhere around about the 4%. So. For me, watch the 10-year at three and a half. The trouble is starting at four and a half. We are in full bull market phase. It'll happen. How quickly will it happen? I don't know. At the, at, at, at the beginning of this year, when we were hitting up, when we were hitting three percent for the first time over there, uh, no, where are we? Back to there. We were hitting three percent for the first time in, in like a decade or more. Man, markets got freaked. And then it pulled back, and now they're not freaked. When it starts to hit three and a half, markets will get freaked again. So if you want to watch one indicator which tells you when the U.S. will hit the bear market, I think it's going to be your 10-year, and I think it's going to be three and a half percent as it stretches into four and ultimately four and a half. And that will it, it will go up to that level. It absolutely will. Will it be this year or next or the year after? That I don't know, but it absolutely will get to three and a half, and eventually it will get to four and a half. Of that, there's no doubt. The speed is the only thing that we need to debate. And at the moment, the Federal Reserve is, 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 is being moderate. I mean, we'll probably get four or five increases out of them next year in terms of their interest rates, um, which means that certainly by 2020, we will be in that zone. We might even get to it next year. The other trick is high interest rates and a lot of your valuation methodologies actually decreases the values of the stock. I'm not going to go into how DCFs and DuPonts and all of those work. Uh, you can Google them. Um, so what's very important about this is that this is not a crisis-driven scenario. This is just markets behaving rationally for the first time in a decade. This is not the credit crisis of 2008 or the Asian Tigers of 98 and, and so the various other crises that we've had over, over the many years. Um, Personal and corporate debt are not concerns. Even though we have had immensely low interest rates in large swaths of the world, what we haven't seen is the average American going in and debting themselves the way they were in 06, 07, and that lead up to there, where people were flipping houses. Where I mean, it was insane. I mean, at, at one point, the estimate is that something like 25% of houses that were tr being bought in America were either being bought to flip or to, or to rent. I mean, it's just not sustainable. Um, and a couple of things have happened. We've got much more stringent on credit. We've got a lot more stringent in terms of compliance and the banks. I mean, they had those things called ninja loans or liar loans, where basically, well, we worried you might lie, so we just won't ask the question. Literally. They would, they would give you a loan. They wouldn't ask you how much you earned because they thought you probably didn't earn enough, so they would just ask you, well, do you have a job? Um, yes, well, then you can have money. Um, and, and, you know, and people were rebonding because the property prices were going crazy. You bought a house at X, and literally within a year or two, it was worth one and a half times X. So you rebond, and you go and buy a flat screen TV. That's lovely until the house price collapse. And now your house is worth this, and your bond is worth twice what your house is worth. Um, and we had a proper 
financial crisis. This is not. Personal debt is not out of control. Corporate debt is, is not even slightly out of control. In fact, corporates have got incredibly low debt levels. Um, they, they, an argument could be made they should have, in the low interest rate cycle, had higher debt levels. They've been buying back shares aplenty. The average American is still far too scarred from what happened in the, in, in, in the credit crisis. The, the millennials are like, man, you old people have just messed up my life and I don't trust the stock market. And the baby boomers are like, man, this stuff's scary and I want to go and retire, so please don't break anything. So we don't have the debt levels. Government debt levels are absolutely a problem. And it's a problem that's been getting worse and worse ever since we invented governments, I guess. Government debt levels are simply unsustainable. It's just you know, the fact that Japan can run debt levels of 200% of GDP and that most of Europe and America can run at 100% of GDP, the fact that we can run at 54% debt levels of GDP is just insane. If you were doing that as a personal individual, by now your banker would have taken away your credit card, your house, your car, and probably you pawned your children. The trick is governments own the printing presses. So they can, in theory, print their way out of money. Now, I know that the idea that printing your way out of money is a terrible idea. In truth, it's not a bad idea at all. Because what happens if you print too much money as a government? You do two things. You weaken your currency and you create inflation. Both of those things reduce the value of the debt. So if we've got debt in U.S. dollar as a government, which we don't have, and that's our saving grace. If we've got debt in US dollar, and we like crazy print some money, uh, it's ugly, but if it's in Zara, it's fine. And if we create inflation, I owe you 100 bucks, but inflation is 50%, I'll pay you next year, because to pay you 100 bucks next year is gonna cost me 50% less. So ironically, that owning of the printing press is why in classic economics is a terrifying construct. In truth, if you print enough and you create inflation, you inflate your debt away. And there is appetite. Argentina, who's the last major economy to default on their debt, which they did in the early 2000s, they basically looked at it and said, ah, no. Um, they issued 100-year bonds a little while ago. Oversubscribed threefold. In other words, they were issuing a billion dollars and they got requests for three billion dollars. I wouldn't lend Argentina a biscuit. And people were lending them money for a hundred years. I mean, I, I mean I'm not going to be around in a hundred years. Argentina, I don't know, but I wouldn't. Uh, so there, there's appetite for it. And what's the appetite? Yield. So when, when Greek debt was a 27% yield, in other words, if you lent the Greek government a hundred euros, they would pay you 27% a year on those hundred euros. There was massive demand for it. Why? Well, because some junkies like 27%. Your risk was that Greek would default. Now, I think in that case, the risk of Greece defaulting was never significantly high. But nonetheless, that is your risk. But there are people out there. I mean, we mustn't take our risk profile and assume it on the world. There are funds out there. There's a fund in America, which is a junk bond fund, which has got something like $700 billion. And they buy what you call distressed debt. In other words, debt that the, that the agencies have said, this stuff is junk. It's not investment grade. You won't get your money back. And they're like, yeah, give me some of that, please. Because you know what? If you buy 50 junk bonds and they all pay 25% and 10 of them go bust, you're still ahead of the curve. You've still made money. So there's always appetite. You know, when the Steinhoff bonds and the African bank and all of those, there was still appetite even when as those companies were collapsing. But critically, we don't have a crisis. Concerns? Sure, there's always concerns. But there's no crisis. We don't have the subprime that we were seeing in, in, in that, that blew up in 08, 09. Um, that isn't currently on the horizon. And that's not to say that there isn't a crisis bubbling that we don't see or that I don't see that will pop up in the next day, week, month, year, or decade. But right now, no crisis, just a good old-fashioned normal correction. So typically, how long do they last? About two years. Top, bottom, back to top. That entire cycle, usually about two years. The crisis of 2008, a little bit longer, two and a half years. Literally, from the top, 50% down, back to where we started, two and a half years. It felt like a lot longer, but it was only two and a half years. So we peaked in November of 2017. So if you want to be really, really, really brave, you could say we're halfway through the bear market. But I have concerns. And my concerns are quite simple. If the US carries on running, and if the US makes new highs, and that is my thesis of what will happen in the short term over the next six to 12 months, that will then pull us and help us a bit. Will we run? How much? I don't know. 
the trick is when the America, when the U.S. does hit bear market and when the U.S. does go down 20%, we're not going to come out of that unscathed. If the U.S. carries on down another 10 or 15% as of today to make it into a bear market, there's no chance that we're not going to also fall another 10 or 15%. And nothing to do with our geopolitical or economic or any other situation. Just purely that, you know, when the U.S. is going down, man, everyone just flees to the safety and, and exits emerging markets, et cetera, et cetera. So my concern is, can we avoid a drawdown when the U.S. bear hits? The answer is no. We might not draw down as much. Our saving grace could be the U.S. goes down 20 and we only go down 10 or 15. Of course, we're already 20 down. So uh, timing is absolutely the matter. The key point is our market is cheap by any metric. Forward PEs, dividend yields, DCFs, our market is cheap. We were, ex very, four or five years ago, our market was very, exp not very expensive, was expensive. Our market is currently cheap on almost any metric. That top 40, the different, the banks, I mean, there is just cheap, 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 and cheap. But it doesn't mean it can't get cheaper. We did see an interesting thing, that horror update from ShopRite on Monday, and at one point the stock was green. The, the market went crazy and was suddenly just buying SA Inc. Um, and at some point it'll, you know, we will come back. But, but certainly my concern is, is the US, and that's why I'm watching S&P, I'll be with you in a sec, S&P rather than us, because whilst I know we are our own little island, let's be honest, we are a very little island. So long-term uh, historic average, at, oh, at, hmm, at the moment, our, our forward PE right now is about 12 and a half, depending on what you assume growth to be, but about 12 and a half. Our long-term average PE is probably closer to 15 or 16, um, which means we're at discount to our long-term average. And that's not because the companies in our stock market are doing spectacularly well. It's because the price is where it was four and a half years ago. So they've made, they've increased profits in those four and a half years. Let's call it 30%. Not annualized, 30% over the entire period. Price hasn't moved, which means those shares are 30% cheaper because you're getting 30% more profit for your buck. Um, th and there's one exception, Japan. So I say there, all bears pass except Japan. So Japan's stock market peaked in the 1980s. And, well, that was at 40,000, and now they're at 21. We hope. I mean, if, I mean, I mean, this might be the future for planet Earth, in which case, hello, Mars. Um, there are some steep anomalies in Japan. Uh, you know, some of them are to do with being totally destroyed after a world war. Some of them are to do with a very aging population. Some of them are to do with this favorite investment in Japan is either cash or trading FX. Um, there, there are some weirdities in Japan, but nonetheless, that chart is the disproof of everything I said, and my argument is going to be this is the exception that proves the rule. And if I'm wrong about that, you know what? None of this matters. It's water and pumpkin seed. The point is, is people look at that and say, oh, this is terrible, and this is why you should never buy ETFs. If you bought an ETF on that day and never invested again, you have had more pain than you can possibly imagine. But no half-intelligent investor buys once and never again. And this is, if you had bought an ETF on that day and then every month thereafter, your averaging price is somewhere around about there, and you're actually making money and you're surviving. And if you had started buying those ETFs back in the 70s or so, and there's, and I don't want to uh, the whole collapse, etc. But Japan has never worked out how to get out of that problem, which was basically quantitative easing. The U.S. did, right? The U.S. went straight away to throw a trillion dollars at the problem and take interest rates to zero. It took Europe about three or four years to work that out. It took Japan 20 years to work it out. Um, and it, you know, it, it's worked. I mean, you know, the market since they discovered it is up by 300 percent, but unfortunately, they lost two decades. And when that chart gets to a new all-time high, man, there's going to be a party, like the whole of Japan. So what do we do? JC is cheap. Of that, there's no doubt. Can get cheaper. Of that, there's no doubt, too. But this is not Black Friday. This is not like it's crazy, and if you don't buy today, there will never be an opportunity like this again in the rest of your life. That's never true. Um, so know what you like. Know the prices that you're prepared to 
to pay and, and don't be in a hurry. You know, I, when, when Christa Visa was selling some shop rights and it dropped to 208, I went and bought a truckload. Well, that was stupid because now it's at 178. And, and, you know, so you like, you see a share, you like the price, nibble, buy a bit, come back in a week, come back in a few. You know, the worst case is it goes up and then you've got to pay a little bit more, which means maybe everything's over. Um, there is cheap stuff out there. Focus on the quality. Or at this point, quality. Don't buy, don't go, I'll come to the don'ts in a moment. F know what you like, know the prices that you like, and be, 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 be cautious, be patient. There's no mad rush here. Gently be buying. Um, there's some stocks in crash mode. Man, there are a lot of stocks in our market very much in crash mode. But don't get too excited. Aspen is not going back to 440 anytime in a hurry. 440 was crazy at 160, it's fair. Um, you know, Mediclinic, I don't know. Uh, famous brands around 100. 180 was expensive. 100, truthfully, might, uh, I don't think it's cheap at 100. But you know, there's, there's, we mustn't fixate on what was and like, we've got to buy now because it's going back to there. Uh, you know, it might be Japan. Hey? It might take another 60 years to get back to there. Um, but there certainly is some great quality, unless it is the end of the world, in which case none of this matters. Water, pumpkin seeds. You've heard me say that all before. Careful of the recovery stocks. Careful of those stocks that are Avenge springs to mind just as one random one to pull out. Oh, it, you know, if, you are, if, if you're a company and you're struggling in this environment, Man, your odds of survival are slim. This is not an environment to be struggling in, particularly if you're SA Inc. We have no growth. We have no money. We have no nothing except unemployment. I mean, yes, you know, if Avenger is going back, as a friend of mine says, to 10 Rand, and for goodness sake, my friend is, was and is and remains drunk because Avenger is never going to 10 Rand. If Avenger is going to 10 Rand, you don't need to buy it at 5 cents. You can buy it at a buck and make a fortune. Or maybe buy it at 50 cents. But first, let's see some evidence that Avenge isn't going bankrupt. And right now, every inch of evidence says it is. I'm just picking on Avenge. But there's a lot of stocks out there. Uh, Nick Kunz, who, who I have a lot of respect for, uh, Herbrand Smith, they both at, at, at 230 bought Aspen and thought they were the cleverest people in the room. Until it went to 140. And then they didn't feel so clever anymore. In other words, you know, Yes, some things are cheap. Some of them are for good reasons, but be very careful of those ones which are, well, it can survive, and then I'm getting the bargain of the, of, of the century. And the key thing is cash. Watch the cash. Watch the dividends. If dividends start slipping, that is a bad warning. Watch the cash. Are they, if you're not generating cash in this environment, you are in trouble. Um, when the recovery happens, large caps run first. Small and mid caps run later. So let's take a generous view and say our, our recovery, our market has bottomed and we are going to be in bull market in the top 40. It will take three to five years for that bull market to fully play out in our market, which means it's probably three to five years before the small caps start to play. There will be exceptions. But the market buys the big stocks, and when they are crazy expensive, the market starts to panic and then starts to move down the ladder into the smaller and the mid caps. So right now, this space, best left alone. Smaller mid caps, best left alone. I mean, there's some quality there. Even sent over, which is probably my favorite share in the whole wide world, came out with results on Tuesday, and the kindest thing I can say about them was that they were okay. I mean, just okay. Not exciting. And, and Centova is a proper quality operation. And they gave us growth of like 3%. So that space, the small mid cap space, is going to be paying for a while still to come. Um, ETS, things are on sale. Just carry on carrying on. I do my monthly debits. They go off on the third of every month. I don't know why the third, but they do. And I buy my ETFs every month. Boom, cash. Buy them. At the moment, they're cheaper, which is lacquer, which means I'm getting some nice RAND cost averaging. At points, they're expensive. But the point with the ETFs is they're multi-decade holds, and opportunities like this just get cheaper. And when we zoom the chart out, I, I can go find it just now. I'll show you the crisis of 98 and the crash of 87. And when you're looking at 30 years of chart data, you can't see it. And one day, the crisis of 08 would disappear into the data as well. And certainly this current bear market one day, it just, you know, in 30 years when you're telling your grandchildren about the, the crisis of 2018 and they say, oh, show me on the chart. And you're like, I can't see it. It's not because your eyes are bad. 
it's because it just becomes irrelevant in the big picture. That's what ETFs are there for. So ETFs just carry on buying as per always. If you're a trader, same old, right? If you're a trader, you trade the price and you obey the stops. End of story, no questions asked. And if you are a blend of all three, well, then the different rules for the different parts, absolutely. So how low can our top 40 go? So we're technically out of the bear. That bear market literally lasted about an hour, hour and a half Wednesday last week. We're technically out because we're no longer 20% off the lows. Um, I think that the easy one is that we could go back to the bottom of that four and a half year range, which from current levels takes us another 10% lower on the top 40. I'm not saying that I think that's where we are going, but certainly if we are going to continue lower, I think that's what we will end up doing. I, however, think that we are probably not, um, and that's because I suspect, and I'm not seeing what I'm looking for. Ah, oh, there it is. Um, my theory on how this is going to play out, and there are caveats galore here. Uh, locally, we have a bear. I think that worst case is probably another 10% down. Watch the 10-year treasury in the U.S., I think the U.S. is going to rally higher. There are a few caveats. The midterm elections on Tuesday, which truthfully, I mean, you know, Trump won and the market went up 40% in the next two years, so who knows. Um, but we're still seeing strong earnings coming through, and that 10-year is still floating around 3.1, 3.2. I think that it can carry on going. The confirmation is new highs. When, I, when the S&P hits new highs, then all bets are back on, and we're back on bull mode. I think that at some point, towards the end of next year or into 2020, we'll see that 10 years starting to hit three and a half, and then the US pulls the bull market. What are we going to do in the meantime? I think we're gonna rally. I really do think we're gonna rally. And I, in part, I'm talking my book because man, I'm invested in this market. So please, dear, whoever you are, rally us. But I think we're gonna rally for a couple of reasons. One, because US is rallying, uh, and that gives markets some comfort. And then they, as soon as they get comfortable, they want some risk. And where do they get their risk? Well, they get it in EMs. And understand, in the world of EMs, we're quite high on that list. I mean, our competitors are Putin and, and Turkey and Saudi Arabia and Venezuela and, I mean, these are not A-grade competition. Okay, some of our competition is Vietnam and a little higher grade, but there's a lot of proper CD and E type grade competition out there. So my, my sense is, is that we will run, we're not going to do massively, we might make highs next year, but we could run 10, 15% and, and get us into the sort of 52, 54 thousands again. That would then play out to late next year, early 2020s. Obviously, there's a lot that's happening on the ground geopolitically and economically in our in our country. Uh, economically, I mean, we're just in the dwang, aren't we? I mean, there's no bones about it. Adrian Gould this morning at the Discovery Summit was talking about it. We, we lost a decade, which we understand. But Adrian Gould takes it a step further and says, what does that lost a decade mean? And he takes it down into rands and cents. In his view, we should all be 27% richer if we hadn't lost that decade. If we could have just done 3.5% growth through that decade. Remember, before the crisis, when we still had Tarbo and Becky as president, we were growing at 5%. So we should all be 27% per capita as a per capita. We should all be, I mean, that, that, is, that is humongously significant because you don't get that back. We're all just on a lower base. Ten years later, we're on a lower base and we're starting from a, it, 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 I mean, it's a, it's a Greek tragedy, except it's not Greek, it's Zuma, but anyway. Um, but I do, but, I mean, let's, not, let's make no bones about it, that when we look out across the landscape of South Africa today, we see a better landscape than we saw a year ago. No one can deny that. Um, I, mean, will, I mean, will Melissa Gagaba resign for lying to a judge? I mean, Nene just lied to a TV station, and Melissa Gagaba lied to a judge, and the Constitutional Court and the Public Protector has said you can't do that. Um, Time will tell. But, and I, I think, I mean, Soren Raposa knows what he's doing. He's playing a long game. He has this most cunning thing, right? Everyone's saying, why is no one in jail yet? Well, because we have short-term memories. Look at all of these, all these uh, committees and commissions and things that are happening. When do they start wrapping up? End of this year, early next year. So when do people start getting arrested and taken to court? Well, March, April next year. When's our election? May. We have an election in May. We always have elections in May because 27 April, 1, 1 May are big days in the ANC life. So May is our election. And if he can have some people going to court in the weeks up ahead of that, you don't want to be an opposition party in that thing. So, I mean, 
the, the Surah Maposa, I mean, it looks quickly, and I'm out of time. Let's go all the way back to Surah Maposa, who was supposed to be Mandela's deputy and our president instead of Tabo Mbeki, and lost it and managed to play the long game so well that he came back 20 years later. I appreciate Nazrik was close, but 20 years, that man plays the long game better than most of us. And he makes five-day cricket look like a T20 match. <laughs> so the short answer is keep calm and carry on carrying on. And if you've ever heard me speak, this is always what I say. Keep calm and carry on carrying on. Because as I say, if it is the end of the world, your investments are not the problem. Your problem is do you have enough water and pumpkin seeds? Now in Cape Town, your problem is you have no water. I flew in here this morning, man. Yeah, yeah, you got some water. But yo, man, not a lot of it. Like, like not a lot of it. Like, like you folks need to go live in KZN. Just saying. The water is warm and there's lots of it because we have mountains and rain and stuff like that. Um, but it's always about carrying on, carrying on. Investing... It taunts you, and markets correct, and markets crash, and markets go bearish, and your favorite stock hits you in the head, and then just when you think it's fine, it drops a block on your head, and then you think it's fine, and then it shoots you in the head. This is what markets do. Our job is to say, you know what? i got time on my side. This is a long game, and opportunities like this come along. They happen. That's fine. Thank you, ladies and gents.